No researchers from today have been able to match the terms of Treaty 72 to the Saugeen boundaries illustrated on any of the maps produced in the 1855 survey by Chief Surveyor Charles Rankin. Of the maps he did produce, not one shows a physically drawn borderline terminating the northeast corner of the Saugeen Reserve at midpoint Lot 31. In 2017, I was the first to match the treaty terms to Charles Rankin's final map, which was accepted as the official plan by Indian Affairs in 1856. The evidence that led to matching the treaty terms to the final map doesn't just conclusively prove the Saugeen Band received the boundaries they had negotiated. It also explains why the vague notation on the 1855 draft survey map holds no relevance in establishing midpoint lot 31 as the Saugeen Reserve's northeast corner termination point. In 2017, an Ontario land surveyor with fresh eyes on the boundary problem pointed out to me that the measurement from Copway Road to lot 2526 Main Street falls within the treaty definition of about nine and a half miles. Without the benefit of the research and musings of others that precede this report, I would not have had the epiphany in 2017 that in order for the treaty terms to match Rankin's final map, it is necessary and correct to merge the Copway Road Amendment instructions with the original instructions from Treaty 72. There are five main issues to understanding Charles Rankin's survey. They are 1. Establishing where the 1855 Saugeen Band believed they initially agreed their treaty negotiated boundaries of 1854 were to be located. 2. Correctly interpreting the convoluted wording of Treaty 72 regarding the Saugeen First Nation Reserve boundaries. 3. Explaining the significance or insignificance of the Northeast Angle Indian Reserve notation located at midpoint lot 31 on the 1855 draft map. 4. Correctly interpreting how the Copway Road Amendment altered the original intention for the Saugeen First Nation Reserve boundaries, specifically the 9.5 mile shoreline measurement and the northern extent of the eastern boundary. 5. Correctly interpreting what was meant by This change will give the Saugeen Indians a small increase in frontage on Lake Huron, stated in the Copway Road Amendment. Most of these complications could have been avoided right from the beginning, had the evidence been interpreted properly. The most dramatic misinterpretations that altered the course of this land claim investigation involved two items from the Copway Road Amendment evidence. First, Charles Rankin declared that the Copway Road Amendment could be carried out without altering the terms of the treaty in any way. Saugeen First Nation researchers of today interpreted this as supporting the Saugeen Band's claim and that the original instructions of the treaty were to be followed word for word, meaning the nine and a half mile shoreline measurement was to begin from the original western boundary where it is bounded to Lake Huron. This is not what Rankin meant. Saugeen First Nation researchers confused Rankin's statement of terms of the treaty to mean the actual wording of the treaty would not be altered in any way. This is incorrect. In fact, it is necessary and correct to merge the wording from the Copway Road Amendment with the original treaty instructions in order for the terms of the treaty to remain intact. The second misinterpretation. The September 1855 Copway Road Amendment clearly states that the western boundary is no longer to be bounded to Lake Huron as described in the original treaty instructions, but instead the western boundary is to be bounded to Lake Huron at Copway Road. This is a very significant change since it establishes Copway Road as the new starting point for the nine and a half mile shoreline measurement. Experts working on behalf of Saugeen First Nation assumed the Copway Road Amendment's purpose was to give more territory to the Saugeen Band based on the statement from the amendment that said, 
This change will give the Saugeen Indians a small increase of frontage on Lake Huron. This led them to believe the distance and change as a result of relocating the western boundary would be in addition to the original description of the nine and a half mile shoreline measurement. An opposing expert was very close to exposing the folly of the Saugeen First Nation argument. Unfortunately, he assumed the original instructions were to be followed as stated rather than merged as well. However, he did recognize that since the eastern boundary could not be contained within a block of land north from Lot 26 to midpoint Lot 31, it was impossible for the shoreline boundary to continue past the dividing line of Lot 2526. Because of this impossibility, he explained, is why Rankin simply intended to terminate the reserve at Lot 2526. Even though this conclusion was logical and for the most part correct, it left the impression that the Saugeen First Nation didn't receive the nine and a half mile shoreline boundary they were promised. While these misinterpretations are very slight, and perhaps even understandable, it changes the whole meaning and purpose of the Copway Road Amendment. As a result, no one uncovered that the current Saugeen First Nation shoreline boundary from Copway Road to Lot 2526 Main Street also equals almost exactly nine and a half miles, or about nine and a half miles. This could not be a magical coincidence. During negotiations of the Copway Road Amendment, in August 1855, Charles Rankin reported to Lord Bury. In that report, he referred to a drawing and made the comment, The red narrow line is the place of a line of a road formerly cut out for the use of the Indians, and then called Copway Road. They professed to have believed at the time of the treaty that this road was to form the northeast limit of this portion of the surrender, and still desire to retain all to the north of it. This statement establishes that, right from the beginning of negotiations, the 1855 Saugeen Band believed that the reserve's western boundary was to be bound to Lake Huron at Copway Road. This also establishes that, to be in accordance with the treaty, the 1855 Saugeen Band also believed that the 9.5 mile shoreline measurement was to begin at Copway Road. This being the case, According to the 1855 Saugeen Band's understanding of the original intent of the treaty, the nine and a half mile measurement should terminate at Lot 2526, exactly where it is today. That was the purpose of the Copway Road Amendment, to give the Saugeen Band what they believed they had originally negotiated. An associate drew my attention to some compelling evidence related to my boundary dispute research in a book called the History of the Saugeen Indians by Peter Smaltz. While we know the Saugeen First Nation believed from the beginning Copway Road was to make up the reserve's western boundary, it begs the question, why was there such a discrepancy between what Saugeen First Nation believed their western boundary should be and what Indian Affairs believed it should be? After all, the treaty was signed and the treaty instructions regarding the Saugeen Reserve were accepted as stated. One might think the problem was due to a language barrier, and quite possibly this could have been a factor, but for the most part, the discrepancy was a result of a very significant mistake made by Lawrence Oliphant, the Superintendent of Indian Affairs in 1854. I will paraphrase how Peter Schmaltz describes this mistake in his book. Lawrence Oliphant was the government official who negotiated Treaty 72. While establishing the Copway Road line, Oliphant was without a compass and simply considered the road to run due north when it actually runs in a northwesterly direction. Oliphant was fully aware Saugeen First Nation desired Copway Road as their western boundary and he had full intention of granting them their wish. When Oliphant made the instruction that the western boundary was to run in a due north straight line from the Saugeen River, he was incorrectly thinking he was making a direct reference to Copway Road. As a result, both Charles Rankin and George Gould, on two separate occasions, positioned the western boundary incorrectly since Oliphant deemed it unnecessary to mention Copway Road as the intended survey marker in the original treaty instructions. 
The resulting positioning of the western boundary infuriated the Saugeen Band. Oliphant's simple yet very significant mistake of not identifying the proper direction of Copway Road led to considerable problems for the Rankin Survey in 1855 and is what has ultimately led to the boundary dispute we are having today. What did the treaty say, and did the reserve boundaries change with the Copway Road Amendment? The most significant instruction in relation to the Saugeen First Nation's current claim to Sable Beach is the first one, which describes the location and extent of the western boundary. The original treaty instruction is this, all that block of land bounded on the west by a straight line running due north from the river Saugeen at the spot where it is entered by a ravine immediately to the west of the village and over which a bridge has recently been constructed to the shore of Lake Huron. That entire description adds up to one straight line and the intended nine and a half mile shoreline measurement was to begin here. However, the Copway Road Amendment states that the nine and a half mile measurement is no longer to begin at this point, but instead is to begin at Copway Road. This requires merging the Copway Road instruction with the first instruction from Treaty 72. The merged instruction reads as follows. All that block of land bounded on the west by the Indian path called the Copway Road, which takes a northwesterly direction to the shore of Lake Huron from a straight line running due north from the River Saugeen at the spot where it is entered by a ravine immediately to the west of the village and over which a bridge has recently been constructed. The nine and a half mile measurement therefore begins at Copway Road. But what about the northeast angle Indian Reserve notation located at midpoint lot 31 on the 1855 draft map? First, we must analyze Charles Rankin's perspective and actions. Since the Saugeen First Nation dispute of the western boundary didn't occur until late May of 1855, we know that it was Charles Rankin's belief from October 1854 until almost June of 1855 that the original treaty instructions were to be followed. We also know that Rankin traversed the Lake Huron shoreline from the mouth of the Saugeen River to the mouth of the Sauble River in late October 1854 marking off some 60 distances of the contours of the shoreline along the way. He then surveyed the eastern boundary of the tongue of the town plot in early November, which also represented the western boundary of the Saugeen Reserve. No one knows for sure when, or even specifically why, Rankin made the notation Northeast Angle Indian Reserve at midpoint lot 31. It is most logical that he made the notation between October 1854 and May 1855, and more likely closer to October 1854. After all, he had just traversed and measured the Lake Huron shoreline with the original treaty instructions from the same month of October still fresh in his mind. However, he could have made the notation later than May 1855. One expert pointed out that Rankin used the midpoint lot 31 location as a starting point to locate the true northeast terminus of the Saugeen Reserve, where the shore meets land 1.4 miles south, just inside the dividing line of lot 2526. From this perspective, Rankin could have made the notation in early September 1855, when he was surveying the eastern boundary. Regardless, Whatever his motivation was for making the notation and when are irrelevant in supporting midpoint lot 31 as the intended northeast terminus of the Saugeen Reserve. After the Copway Road Amendment, the final intent of the treaty was to terminate the northeast corner of the Saugeen Reserve at lot 2526 Main Street. Therefore, even if the Northeast Angle Indian Reserve notation indicates Treaty 72's original intent for the location of the northeast corner of the Saugeen Reserve, it holds no relevance in determining the final, amended intent of Treaty 72 for locating the northeast corner of the Saugeen Reserve. To prove the Northeast Angle Indian Reserve notation, is a non-factor in determining the intent of Treaty 72, 
It is time to match the terms of Treaty 72's amended Saugeen First Nation boundary to Rankin's final map of 1856. The ultimate proof Saugeen First Nation received the reserve boundaries they had negotiated and were promised. So what are the terms of the treaty? Term number one. The western boundary is to be bound to Lake Huron and its origin is from a straight line running due north from a ravine located at the Saugeen River. Term two. The southern boundary is to run along the northern portion of the recently surrendered strip. Term number three. The shoreline boundary is to be measured along the coast for nine and a half miles and is to begin from where the western boundary is bound to Lake Huron. Term number four. The eastern boundary is to run south from where the shoreline boundary terminates at the coast and then run parallel to the western boundary until it reaches the northern portion of the recently surrendered strip. Term number five. When all the boundaries are connected, they are to make up a block of land. To prove the listed terms match Rankin's final and official map, I will use the merged treaty instructions to match the illustrated outline of the Saugeen Reserve found on Rankin's final and official map of 1856. I will then compare the results to the required treaty terms listed on the screen to prove Rankin's final illustration is in compliance. Instruction 1. All that block of land bounded on the west by the Indian path called the Copway Road, which takes a northwesterly direction to the shore of Lake Huron from a straight line running due north from the River Saugeen at the spot where it is entered by a ravine immediately to the west of the village and over which a bridge has recently been constructed. Instruction 2. On the south, by the aforesaid northern limit of the lately surrendered strip. Instruction 3. On the east, by a line drawn from a spot upon the coast at a distance of about nine and a half miles from the western boundary aforesaid. Instruction 4. And running parallel thereto until it touches the aforementioned northern limit of the recently surrendered strip. It is important to point out that the western boundary still runs due north to where Copway Road begins, which enables the eastern boundary to be on the same due north direction, making it parallel to the western boundary, even though most of the western boundary runs in a northwesterly direction along Copway Road. Now I will test Rankin's illustrated outline that you see on his final map to see if it conforms to the terms of the treaty. The western boundary is bound to Lake Huron and it originates from a straight line running due north from a ravine located at the Saugeen River. This is a match. The southern boundary does run along the northern portion of the recently surrendered strip. This is a match. The shoreline boundary does equal nine and a half miles which can easily be verified if there is any doubt. It also begins where the western boundary is bound to Lake Huron at Copway Road, as instructed in the amendment. This is also a match. The eastern boundary does begin where the shoreline boundary terminates at the coast at Lot 2526, and does run south parallel to the straight line portion of the western boundary. It terminates at the northern portion of the recently surrendered strip. This is a match, and all of the boundaries are contained within a block of land. This is the final match in order to meet all the requirements of the terms of Treaty 72. As I previously stated, the Copway Road Amendment didn't change the terms of the treaty, but it did add more words, which changed the first instruction. The shoreline measurement is still nine and a half miles, still agreeing with the terms. It just begins from a different location. When the amendment wording is merged with the original treaty wording, the description is a perfect match to what Rankin illustrated the Saugeen Reserve boundaries to be on the 1856 final and official map, submitted to and accepted by Indian Affairs. 
Considering the amended treaty terms identically match the 1856 final map, the next problem to discuss is not so much a problem as it is a housekeeping issue for clarification. Clarification of what was meant by this change will give the Saugeen Indians a small increase in frontage on Lake Huron, stated in the Copway Road Amendment. It has already been established that in 1855, it was impossible for the shoreline frontage to exist from Lot 26 to Midpoint Lot 31 to enable the eastern boundary of the Saugeen Reserve to extend any further north. Therefore, we also know it is impossible for the increase in frontage mentioned in the amendment to be in addition to a 9.5 mile measurement that includes the distance between Lot 26 and Midpoint Lot 31. Having established that, we also have to realize that since there is no one left alive from the Rankin survey, any further discussion on this topic is pure speculation. However, based on the evidence, I will offer two explanations that would appear to be the most logical. Explanation 1. In 2016, I found Charles Rankin's January 1855 Gray Bruce map. It was never used as evidence by other researchers but its importance is that it illustrates how early on Rankin considered Lot 2526 Main Street to be the northeast corner of the Saugeen Reserve. It is also the only Rankin map that shows the original western boundary as a solid line, since it predates the Saugeen Band's western boundary uprising in May of 1855. Even in the absence of the lots, if the scale of the map is used, it can be calculated that the northeast boundary of the Saugeen Reserve terminates at Lot 2526. Therefore, we know that it was as early as January 1855 that Rankin considered Lot 2526 the northeast corner of the Saugeen Reserve, just two months after three significant events. The signing of Treaty 72, Rankin's traverse of the Lake Huron shoreline, and Rankin's personal survey of the western boundary in November. It was later resurveyed by assistant George Gould in May of 1855. Based on this knowledge, we know that when Rankin was spearheading the negotiations for the Copway Road Amendment, he would be doing so knowing his intention was to terminate the northeast corner of the Saugeen Reserve at Lot 2526 Main Street. This means that before the Copway Road Amendment was even considered, Rankin's intention was to create a shoreline boundary that measured 8.1 miles in length. Knowing Rankin's intentions and considering his close involvement with the Copway Road Amendment, if the increase in frontage mentioned is, in fact, the distance between the original western boundary and Copway Road, it is only in addition to the 8.1 miles Rankin was intending which would bring it back to the originally negotiated 9.5 miles. Therefore, since it is impossible for frontage to exist between Lot 26 and Midpoint Lot 31, the increase referred to is in addition to 8.1 miles, not in addition to 9.5 miles. This argument is definitely a firm possibility, but in my opinion, there is an even more likely explanation. Explanation 2 Considering the small increase in distance was never identified in the amendment, it is more likely that the increase was so small that it still fell within the about 9.5 mile definition from the treaty, leaving it unnecessary to identify the actual distance. Even though today we consider 1.4 miles a relatively small distance, if the increase was intended to be an addition to a boundary that is only 9.5 miles in distance to begin with, a 1.4 mile increase is quite significant. It is difficult to believe a distance of that length would not be identified in the Copway Road Amendment, particularly when you consider that in the same memorandum that contained the Copway Road Amendment, as little as 1 and 2 mile increases or decreases in frontage in the Cape Croker Amendment were located and described in detail. The about 9.5 mile definition of the Saugeen Reserve shoreline leaves considerable wiggle room 
for any small increases in frontage, and therefore it would be unnecessary for an actual distance to be identified. Regardless of which explanation makes the most sense, they are both reasonable arguments. Considering the evidence, both arguments support the history and the outcome of the Copway Road Amendment. Think about the Saugeen First Nations explanation. The increase in frontage as a result of relocating the western boundary is in addition to a nine and a half mile shoreline boundary that inexplicably includes a one and a quarter mile stretch where it is impossible for frontage to exist. There is no way to make any sense of this argument. It is important to understand the significance of matching the amended treaty terms to Rankin's final and official map of 1856. It makes the argument that Rankin surveyed the eastern boundary incorrectly irrelevant. The nine and a half mile shoreline measurement from Copway Road terminates at lot 2526 Main Street, which also marks the starting point of the eastern boundary running south. Even if you could prove some improper method was used, to survey the eastern boundary, it has no bearing on any of the other lots north of the dividing line at lot 2526 Main Street. The nine and a half mile shoreline measurement stops the eastern boundary from extending any further north of this location. The improper surveying of this eastern boundary argument, along with the original intent of the nine and a half mile shoreline measurement terminating at midpoint lot 31, are both inconsequential in supporting the Saugeen First Nation claim to Sobel Beach. The Copway Road Amendment argument matches the amended terms of Treaty 72 to the final and official map Rankin submitted to Indian Affairs in 1856. This is the ultimate evidence in proving Saugeen First Nation received the reserve boundaries they were promised. The 1855 Saugeen Band didn't dispute and disrupt the survey of the western boundary in May of 1855 to gain more territory. They simply wanted what they believed they had negotiated. At the time of the Saugeen Band's western boundary dispute, the eastern boundary had not yet been surveyed. When it was surveyed in September of 1855, and the northeast corner of the reserve was located at lot 2526 without further dispute. This is a clear statement that the Saugeen Band were satisfied they had received what they were promised. Alternately, Indian Affairs didn't grant the Saugeen Band an amendment to the treaty as an appeasement to offer more territory to stop the disruption of the survey. What would be the motivation for Indian Affairs to grant the Saugeen Band more territory that they had not asked for. To illustrate how simple the history of the survey of the Saugeen Reserve is when it is properly interpreted, I will summarize the whole boundary dispute issue in just a few sentences. The Saugeen Band of 1855 complained the western boundary was positioned incorrectly. Indian Affairs agreed and the western boundary was relocated. As a result, the western boundary was no longer bound to Lake Huron from a due north straight line, it was bound to Lake Huron at Copway Road. By definition of the treaty terms, this affected the nine and a half mile shoreline boundary starting point. As a result, the nine and a half mile shoreline boundary no longer starts here and ends at midpoint lot 31. It starts at Copway Road and ends at lot 2526 Main Street. The explanation to this boundary dispute is no more complicated than that. It is the most consistent explanation using the available historical facts. Following this simple chain of documented events I have just described is the only, I repeat, the only explanation that allows for the treaty terms to match Charles Rankin's final map. Conclusive proof, Treaty 72 not only honored the terms of the treaty, but also honored the reserve boundaries Saugeen First Nation desired and believed they had negotiated in 1854. In 1855, the Saugeen Band had a legitimate boundary dispute. It was dealt with and corrected over 160 years ago, and the boundary dispute of today is no more than a manipulation of the facts and the truth. There is nowhere else to look other than the Copway Road Amendment argument 
for a resolution to this boundary dispute. In August 2019, Ms. Jane Deeks, a press secretary for Crown Indigenous Relations, revealed to the Own Sound Sun Times that the federal government had reviewed a similar, more comprehensive presentation I had submitted to what you have just viewed. She claimed the presentation had no effect in changing the federal government's position in supporting Saugeen First Nations boundary dispute. The way I have interpreted Rankin's Copway Road Amendment declaration that the terms of the treaty are not to be altered in any way leads to an undeniable match of the terms of Treaty 72 to Rankin's final map, yet the federal government sees no significance to this. The federal government sees no significance of my explanation that the relocation of the western boundary to Copway Road would also relocate the 9.5 mile shoreline termination point from midpoint lot 31 to lot 2526. Exactly where it is illustrated to be on Rankin's final map and remains today. The very fact that the shoreline measurement from Copway Road to lot 2526 Main Street equals the distance of the treaty term of about nine and a half miles. It would be hard not to recognize this as something more than just a strange coincidence. The federal government was never before aware of this, but it doesn't impress them. The federal government of Canada, a name defended in this lawsuit, still believes the Saugeen First Nations argument is more in line with the facts. We are talking about an argument that relies exclusively on the original treaty instructions for its support. An argument that completely writes off the Copway Road Amendment as an isolated, separate event from Rankin's survey of the Saugeen Reserve boundaries. An argument that relies on the original treaty instructions, yet ignores that, for their argument to be correct, it requires violating three of the treaty terms. One. The original treaty instructions do not allow the boundaries of the Saugeen Reserve to be contained within a block of land from lot 2526 to midpoint lot 31. The very first five words of the treaty instructions regarding the Saugeen Reserve are all that block of land. If the original treaty instructions were used, this area would exist outside of a block of land in Lake Huron. 2. For the Saugeen argument to be correct, in order for land to exist between lot 2526 and midpoint lot 31, the eastern boundary would have to deviate off the treaty instructed due north line that runs parallel to the western boundary. And three, while I realize the Saugeen First Nation argument does not recognize the Copway Road Amendment as a contributing factor to the final outline of the reserve boundaries, you can't just ignore facts. One of the terms of the treaty is that the shoreline measurement is to begin where the western boundary is bound to Lake Huron, which, after the Copway Road Amendment, is Copway Road. Saugeen First Nations argument accommodates for a shoreline distance from Copway Road to midpoint lot 31 that equals 11 miles, an obvious violation of the treaty term of 9.5 miles. If the treaty violations are not enough, the Saugeen First Nations argument cannot match the original treaty terms on which their argument exclusively relies to any map, not Rankin's final map, or more importantly, the 1855 draft map with the Northeast Angle Indian Reserve notation at midpoint lot 31. None of the arguments from the expert reports have matched the treaty terms to any of Rankin's maps either. In other words, no other research the federal government has seen or ever been made aware of has been able to match the terms of Treaty 72 to any of Rankin's maps, but most significant, his final and official map. Yet, after all these years, when they are finally presented with evidence that can, it has no effect on them, doesn't even raise an eyebrow. I ask you, how can any other argument even be given consideration over the one the only one that can match the treaty terms to Rankin's final map. Allow me to explain the significance of Schmaltz's description of events in relation to Canada's pleading in support of Saugeen First Nation. 
Recently, I have been making inquiries to Crown Indigenous Relations and the Department of Justice as to how they can continue to support the Saugeen First Nation argument based on the fact the treaty terms match Rankin's final map. Eventually, after being sent through a number of channels, I was sent what I considered a very patronizing letter from Canada's lawyers. In the letter, they ignored all the questions I was seeking answers to. With no attempt to hide their evasiveness to five very direct questions I had asked, they simply explained in a tone of indignant arrogance what Canada's position is regarding the Saugeen claim. They drew attention to their main pleading point, that it was the common intention of the treaty parties in 1854 that the stretch of beach that has become the subject of dispute was intended to be part of the First Nations Reserve. Well, thank you very much as if after 30 years I don't know what Canada's position is. However, this was a timely reminder considering the boundary dispute account given in Peter Schmaltz's book. I have pointed it out in this video, and for the last three years I have been trying to point it out to the indignant Canadian government that it was not the common intention of the treaty parties in 1854 that the contentious stretch of beach of today was to be part of the Saugeen First Nations Reserve. It was not even an intention the Saugeen First Nation of 1855 were even aware of. As it turns out, it was not even the intention of Lawrence Oliphant and Indian Affairs. Peter Schmaltz's account of the boundary dispute is absolute confirmation that right from the beginning, Copway Road was the agreed-upon location of the western boundary by both treaty parties, Saugeen First Nation and Indian Affairs. It is therefore conclusive that it was not the common intention of the treaty parties in 1854 that the beach area from Lot 26 to Midpoint Lot 31 was to be part of the Saugeen First Nations Reserve, as Canada claims. It is also conclusive that the amended treaty instructions match Rankin's final map and the reserve boundaries we know today are the boundaries that honour the treaty terms. The only thing that will forever remain inconclusive, and could be more correctly defined as a manipulation of the facts, is the federally supported Saugeen First Nation claim to Sauble Beach from Lot 26 to Midpoint Lot 31.